morning from Seattle and virtual greetings to you all, no matter where you are tuning in from today. I'm Xiao Jing Wu, curator of Japanese and Korean art here at the Seattle Art Museum. Thank you for joining us for a new monthly Saturday University lecture organized by the Gardner Center for Asian Art and Ideas at the Seattle Art Museum. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that the Seattle Art Museum is located on the homelands of the Duwamish people and the traditional territories of the Squamish and Makoshut people. We further acknowledge the many urban indigenous people who call Seattle home. For today's program, special thanks go to our co-presenter, cool Ali Bay Book Company. It has been such a pleasure working with Karen Maeda Alman and Rick Simonson of Ali Bay Book Company, as well as Jane Byrne of the Harper Collins Publishers. And I learned just yesterday that the inspiration for this program was actually from Seattle's celebrated artist, Barbara O. Thomas. Our downtown museum currently has an exhibition of Barbara's work on view, The Geography of Innocence, and it has been very well received. Thank you, Barbara, for your inspiring artwork and for initiating today's program. I would also like add my thanks to our long-standing partner, the Jackson School for International Studies at the University of Washington. And to my colleagues, Rachel Harris, Kevin Higginbottom, and many others for their behind the scenes work. If you are interested in watching the recordings of past lectures, they are available on our YouTube channel. You can find the links on Gardner Center's webpage. Today, we're delighted to have the acclaimed travel writer Colin Thurbron speaking to us from London. Colin will introduce his most recent book, The Armour River, for about 25 minutes, and then the Seattle-based writer, Blaine Harden, will join him for a conversation. Afterwards, we'll open it up for Q&A. To ask a question, please look for a Q&A button on your Zoom screen. Feel free to send us your question at any time during the program, and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. A prolific writer, Colin Thurbron has written more than 20 books, of which seven have won prestigious awards. He's best known for his travel books, including To the Last City, which was long listed for the Man Booker Prize, and the New York Times bestseller, Shadow of the Silk Road. Colin has traversed many remote places in Middle East, Central Asia, Russia, and China that most of us really have a chance to experience firsthand. And through his beautiful writing, he has shared with his writer, readers insights about those parts of the world he has so keenly observed. Today, we'll be hearing about his most recent adventure along the Armour River. After Colin's talk, Seattle's own writer and journalist, Blaine Harden, will be in conversation with Colin. Blaine reported for the Washington Post for 28 years from Africa, Eastern Europe, and Northeast Asia. He was also a raving national correspondent for the New York Times, a contributor to the Economist, and has reported for the PBS Frontline. His six books include three about North Korea, two about the Pacific Northwest, and one about Africa. His first North Korea book, titled Escape from Camp 14, was a global bestseller translated into 28 languages. His coverage of the human cost during the Bosnian War in 1992 won him the Ernie Pyle Award. Now with that, I'm turning the virtual podium over to Colin Zebra. Colin. Thank you. 
Um, most of the Earth's great rivers um, are intrinsic to their nations, or seem so. You can't imagine, for instance, India without the Ganges, let alone Egypt without the Nile, the Mississippi, the Amazon, the Irrawaddy, the Indus, the Yangtze, the Yellow River, they all seem to nourish their nation's heart. But the Amur, which at over almost 3,000 miles is the 10th longest river in the world, draining a basin twice the size of Pakistan, is a frontier, it's a divide, and it's almost unknown. It's the lo longest undammed river in the Eastern Hemisphere um, because dams require the cooperation of the surrounding countries. And for over a thousand miles between Russia and China, it's the most heavily fortified frontier on earth. Well, some years ago, when Russia and China convened to decide where the furthest source of the great Amur River was, they discovered to their chagrin that it arose in neither country, but in the mountains of Northeast Mongolia. Kevin, perhaps we should have a map now. If we find we have a map, it will enable everybody, I hope, um, to have some idea of the extent of this enormous river. Here in the east, um, it flows into the Japan Sea, but far into the, or into the Okos Sea, but far to the west, to the right-hand side of the map, you find somewhere called the Kente, a uh, strictly pre preserved area. And that's the mountains uh, sacred to Genghis Khan of Northern Mongolia. In that far Northeast area, the river is the little Onon, they call it the Holy Mother Onon. And it moves across the Mongolian steppe and crosses into Siberia. Um, and you can see it in a trajectory, a little arc, um, moving further and further eastward until it becomes the Shilka. And finally, it meets the Argun River and becomes the Amur proper. They are at the very top of the map, um, at, or rather at the top of the river's trajectory. You'll see it's the Amur. Um, so there it has a, a change of gender. It's no longer the Holy Mother Onon of Mongolia, but um, the Russia's little father Amur. It curves down in this huge bend um, towards Havarovsk, and there it's the heavily fortified frontier between Russia uh, to the north, of course, and China to the south. At Havarovsk, you see it moving abruptly for 600 miles um, northeast to the Okos Sea, and that is for it, its last extent. Well, my journey began um, about three years ago in August 2018. And this area, this whole area here, is where the great steplands of Central Asia, the Mongolia side, you see, um, meet the Taiga forest, the great forest area of Russia, a fifth of the forest area of the entire earth. And this strictly protected area in the far left of that map, um, it's about 5,000 square miles near the Russian border. It's forbidden to travelers um, and uh, sacred, as I said, to Genghis Khan, who was born here and buried here in a tomb that is still unknown. We could probably leave the map now, Kevin, and go back. That's it. Well, a trusted agent had found me a permit to go into this area and two horsemen and a guide and nine pack horses. Uh, the monsoons had been very heavy that year, um, probably the, um, uh, the, the result of climate change, um, but particularly heavy. And the whole land was treacherous, we were told, and we shouldn't go. But um, it was too late. I already had a permit. And um, the rangers made us sign documents to absolve them of any responsibility for us and um, with our horses. Um, we went into this um, rather forbidding country, this marshland country of Mongolia, 
and I'll read you a, a brief excerpt. We were entering a region that even the horsemen did not know. For four days, they guided our way by the mountains that now surrounded us. The source of the Onanamoa was tiny and diffused when we found it. Ahead of us, it flowed invisibly, its course low and flat through valleys of knee-high shrubs. From a distance, the ground looked innocent, almost landscaped, but its marshlands had rotted over the millennia into fathomless bog. Soon I lost count of the tributaries we fought in. The horsemen charged in like centaurs, the current streaming over their knees, their cigarettes still dangling from their lips. My own horse was old, and I felt a clutch of fear each time he descended. The swamps only deepened, and the horses floundered in the mire, and sometimes they panicked, um, often they fell and rolled. And for 10 days, um, nothing seemed to get better. But eventually, um, we emerged from this, I with um, two fractured ribs and a broken ankle, and was deeply relieved to find the ground of the stepland at last solid under our hooves and the skies opened out. Well, this is a beautiful land, gorgeous with flowers, vetch, asters, clovers, gentians. And we were amongst the Buryat people who were Mongolian people um, who came south during the Russian Civil War, um, hoping to find a peaceful environment, hoping in vain as it happened. And here, we took Land Rover and crossed eventually in, over the Russian border on a river that um, was still quite small and winding untouched between uh, small villages and um, little, little hamlets, really nothing more. The Buryat people um, continue over the border. And um, at Sugo, which is a monastery, um, which is probably the furthest reach of Mongolian Buddhism into Siberia. Um, you found an enormous monastery, but inhabited just by a, a single monk. And um, the, here I found to my um, fear and astonishment that I was caught in the middle of the largest Russian-Chinese military exercise, a joint military exercise for 40 years, over 300,000 men deploying. And I, by pure chance, uh, stuck in this monastery in the middle of it. Um, eventually, I got out, but, and I think, I think this exercise was actually a political act, um, a signal to the West of what China and Russia might do together. Although possibly it was a Russian signal to the Chinese since their contingent was vast, 300,000, and the Chinese small, um, a sign of what might be mustered on their own frontier. But the story of confrontation between Russia and China, um, it started uh, about 100 miles down the river, the little town of Nerchinsk. And here, uh, the Russians and Chinese confronted one another for the first time at the end of the 17th century. The Cossacks had moved at extraordinary speed, uh, 3,000 miles eastward across Siberia, all within 60 years. And they had suborned or, or slaughtered the small tribes people along their way. And suddenly they met a formidable enemy in China. They knew nothing about one another. Both empires were almost ignorant that the other existed. And when they came to make a treaty together, they had no language in common. It had to be conducted in Latin by a learned Pole on the side of the Russians and two Jesuit priests on the side of the Chinese. And they eventually came to an agreement. Uh, what Peter the Great, uh, still a teenager back in Moscow, wanted was to replete, replenish the uh, very depleted um, treasury of his country by trade with China. What the Chinese wanted was simply to get rid of these uncouth northerners who had appeared out of the blue on their northern borders. So in the end, they did, in Latin, achieve what they had both wanted. The Russians got the trade concessions they wanted, but the Chinese more significantly um, had it established that a vast amount of lands north of the Amur River, the whole Amur Basin was by right theirs. And it was a long time 
before the Russians began to niggle at this um, resolution, naming Jesuit perfidy and the idiosyncrasies of geography. But for the moment, in the words of the Chinese ambassador, we made a common oath to live together in harmony. It was not to last. Some 60 miles down the river at the little town of Shetensk, um, the overland traffic used to overland from the West, from Europe and from European Russia, um, met the Amur River where it first became navigable. So this was a especially important little place um, in those days. Now it's been bypassed by the Trans-Siberian Railway and although the river is 400 yards across, um, you can hear people talking on the far side. Um, it's very small and its population is declining. In the 19th century, those vessels that carried people were ironclad paddle steamers, which had been put together in the shipyards of, of Belgium and Glasgow. And one of the first travelers here was the playwright Anton Chekhov, who was ravaged by the sight, the beauty of the sheer land around them. I've seen a million gorgeous landscapes, he wrote home. I feel giddy with ecstasy. And what liberalism, oh, what liberalism. The frankness of its inhabitants amazed him. And the women were smoking cigarettes and the old women were puffing on pipes. People were eating meat in Holy Week. And above all, they were speaking their minds. You might reflect that there was actually uh, nobody much there um, to take them in charge. And there was nowhere for them to be exiled to since they were already in Siberia. Well, I spent a long time waiting for a boat that would take me down near to the Chinese border. I was found, of course, by the local police and interrogated for four hours. I think they were simply bewildered by the spectacle of an old man with a bad limp by then, speaking bad Russian and traveling like a gypsy, um, not a very likely spy. But eventually the boat did take me down river towards China and I found myself looking straight across at the Chinese frontier, this barrage of, of great mountains. For in defiance of the Treaty of Nerchinsk, China has returned to the river. Uh, Russia rather has returned to the river and China retreated. In 1854, the belligerent governor general of East Siberia, Count Moraviev, um, simply put together a flotilla of barges um, filled with cannon and Cossacks and sailed down the river um, and continued to do so for several years, um, basically uh, recapturing it. Uh, or capturing it anew for Russia. The Chinese could do nothing. By then, their dynasty was in helpless decline. And in 1858, um, an infamous to the Chinese treaty was forced on them at Aigun um, on the Chinese bank, in which all the lands north of the Amur were given to Russia. Well, if you look down now, from any point, um, as I did, along the control tracking strip, as they call it, uh, you see on the Russian side, nothing but two great fences of barbed wire with great earth between to betray the passage of anybody crossing and a continuous series of watchtowers. This, indeed, the most heavily fortified frontier on earth. But some 300 miles down river, you come to the first notable town on the Amur called Blagoveshensk. It's uh, by Siberian standards, um, it's young, it, it, it's quite old. It's founded in about 1854, I think, and um, is a mellow, uh, rather uh, depopulating town um, of some 200,000 inhabitants. But just over the river, half a mile over the river on the further side, is the spanking new Chinese city of Hekha. Um, you can see its skyscrapers going up, topped with cranes still building. And um, it is a slightly tormenting vision, if you like, of, a, of an opulence, which is just out of reach um, to Russians over the river. A mere 30 years ago, this was just a village there, um, but now its population is overtaking that of Blagoveshensk. And suddenly here too, 
you see the lovers bustling with traffic for the first time. There are Chinese pleasure boats there, the Russian patrol boats, uh, there are even warships. And on the quayside, um, you see a little but uh, Russian porters, basically, who have traveled over onto the Chinese side um, and are paid by the Chinese to carry Chinese goods back over the river to the Chinese in the markets of Lagovishensk. And there, um, all the goods are Chinese, and of course, they are resented. Um, the Russians say they are sly, they can't be trusted. Um, they work hard, of course, they say, but they have closed hearts. Well, in 1937 to 8, Stalin slaughtered or deported all the Chinese along the Amur River. And now, uh, this local fear of the Chinese has risen again. The Russian provinces along the Amur, after all, number just two million people, whereas the Chinese um, number almost 110 million. So it's no wonder that the Russians are uneasy at their depopulated area. And it was Putin in the year 2000 when he was inaugurated as president, who said if something wasn't done, the inhabitants of the Russian Far East would all be Asian speaking. I will read briefly again. These fears have a troubled hinterland. For 30 years until 1987, the two powers lived in strident enmity. Early estimates of Chinese infiltration maintained that as many as 2 million had crossed into the Russian Far East. The wilder estimates have abated, but the fear is not gone. Illegal migrants make, may evade any statistics, people say, while an old anxiety surfaces that Moscow is far away and has abandoned them. A few years ago, a Russian documentary, China, a Deadly Friend, went well on the internet. A vendor in the market, a well-dressed woman trying to sell Siberian furs, murmurs to me, that the Chinese are coming back and everywhere. She could not tell me exactly where, because they lived unseen, waiting. Such rumors were stoked by alarmist local newspapers that the Chinese lurked in the forests in closed communities. And always they're seen not as persons, but as a composite mass, images of insects and pollutants abound. But no such forest villages have ever been located Recent statistics for the number of Chinese living in Russia's Far East assesses them at a modest 30,000. The Chinese themselves are reluctant to stay. The weather is bitter, they say. The police rapacious, the people hostile. Intermarriage is rare, although some Russian women declare a preference for Chinese men more diligent and sober than their own. Above all, with the collapse of the ruble against the Chinese yuan, business opportunities have faded away. Well, one morning I cross to the Chinese shore. In midstream, where the current darkens, the river becomes the Heilongjiang, the Black Dragon River of China. And I find myself in Heihe, this spanking new city where they're celebrating Golden Week, the anniversary of Mao Zedong's declaration of the Chinese People's Republic in the year 1949. It's um, bursting with celebration. Um, the old signs, there were old signs of them welcoming the Russians. There were topiarized Russian uh, Orthodox cathedrals, little cathedrals. Um, there were um, topiarized Matryoshka dolls and fading signs in Russian, but there were no signs of Russian virtually at all. Um, they simply, with the foreign ruble, they couldn't afford to be there. And in the great marketplace, the free trade zone attached to the city, um, which had once teamed with uh, thousands of Russians, um, uh, there was nobody. It was, it was quite derelict. A Russian friend on the further side of the river, the Russian side, had found me a Chinese uh, acquaintance um, who he said would accompany me on the Chinese shore Otherwise, he thought I would be assassinated or, or, or cruelly cheated. And uh, Liang, when I met him, um, was a, a great relief. He was a rather owlishly sad man, a middle-aged man, little cloth cap, out of work. Um, in fact, he looked a bit down at heel like me. I think we reassured one another. 
And on the Chinese shore, I had no idea what lay ahead. Um, as far as I knew, it might be bristling in our arms like the Russian side. Um, but I, as we continued, Liang and me, um, we weren't stopped. There were no drove blocks. I could see white watchtowers down on the river, but little else. Liang said he would accompany me for 500 miles. And after that, I'd be alone. Anyway, the most striking thing initially was that the straggling homesteads and vegetable patches of the Russian side disappeared and everything was farmed, everything was cultivated. There were maize and wheat fields to the horizon and plastic shrouded ranks of vegetables. And Leon, um, who was depressed um, and, and out of work, he suddenly perked up, um, partly because of the Chinese restaurants that were there um, and uh, we would stay more or less undetected, I think, in little hostels. Um, nobody seemed to bother us. And we made conversation in a sort of hybrid language of our own. I made circuitous routes in Mandarin, a badly retrieved Mandarin, to say things, whereas he insisted on practicing his uh, Russian, but had awful trouble with the cluttered consonants of that language which he had reduced to a sort of despairing mew. And we must have sounded terrible. Uh, Liang also had a habit of talking about me um, to any passing Chinese who was at all interested. He spoke as if I wasn't there. Mr. Tubalong, he said, is a writer from England. He fell off a horse in Mongolia. Yes, his eyes are deep set and his hair sticks up. He is very old, but he can use chopsticks and so on. Almost the first town we came across was Anhui, the site of the old infamous 1858 treaty by which the Russians seized the lands that China had claimed north of the Amur. And in this little town, um, it was supposedly forbidden to foreigners, but nobody seemed to notice me. There was an enormous museum in which um, it seemed a sort of howl of outrage was being sent out at what the Chinese had been deprived of. A, a huge chamber there, in particular, depicted in life-size waxworks, um, how that treaty was imposed. Count Moravia, the bullying Russian governor, is seen in, dripping with epaulettes, hanging over his Chinese counterpart, the wretched Prince Yishan, and um, <clears throat> basically um, bullying him into a subservience. This is, um, this is a treaty which the Chinese um, have not forgotten. I'll read once more. It happens at the height of what China now calls its century of humiliation, in which Britain, France, and the United States, and soon Germany and Japan, wrench concessions from a dynasty in sickly decline. China has since labeled these late treaties unequal, extended under threat, and the old imperial predators, of course, have surrendered their dominion now. Only Russia has never contemplated returning the enormous territories it usurped. The change border was painfully reaffirmed in a series of agreements between 1991 and 2004, and inscribed builders maintain it along either shore. But the wound lingers. During the Cultural Revolution, when the loudspeakers of Red Guards bombarded the Russian bank with propaganda, a sleeping hatred resurrected. Even now, with the border officially settled, the Chinese held to their unequal definition of the Igon Treaty. For the next few days, a series of buses carried Liang and me east along the Amur. Amur. There were no police and no blocks. My fear of being turned back or arrested dissipated. Um, a little prematurely as it happened, because um, at Swabin, Liang and I were briefly arrested just where the, close to where the Songhua tributary, um, which is the most, uh, the largest and the most powerful tributary coming uh, northward from China, um, carries its effluent and, and the industrial cities upriver. And here, uh, Liang was soon to leave me. At Fuyuan, which is the easternmost point of China, um, a little boat takes you back across the river to Russia, to Khabarovsk, the, um, the largest city uh, on the Amur 
at a quarter of a million. In these last hundreds of miles, the river becomes uh, really as wide as an inland sea. You hardly know you're crossing a river and it's surrounded by little scattered villages. Um, some of them are native peoples, mostly of Russian fishermen. And with a tush, rather tough fisherman out to call a Sergei, uh, I plied up and down the shores visiting uh, the leftover villages of the Ulchi, who are native peoples there whose tradition holds a special reverence for bears. Sergei usually laid his nets up side creeks, and we returned, we'd return within a few hours to find them filled with crush and carp uh, and catfish and barbell. Um, alas, he was poaching, um, but uh, he said, you know, it was still the off season, but he said, well, everybody does it, otherwise we'd starve. It was in one of these side creeks, in fact, that a sloop swooped down upon us and two burly men leapt on board, um, but it turned out they were only wanting to share Sergei's vodka. They helped us haul in our nets, they suggested a better place for fishing, and then their sloop swooped away again. I asked Sergei, who the hell were they? Uh, he said, the police. And of course, it's hopeless. Um, the local patrolmen are interleaved um, with the villagers, and they either turn a blind eye to what they're doing, or they extract a small bribe. Well, the river continues getting broader and, or, or it appears more, more deserted um, all the way. And for the last hundred miles, um, it turns into a kind of, or seems to turn to anybody traveling it into a, a kind of wilderness. A scarcely a ship crosses it here. Yet here in the mid 19th century, um, it became the stuff of an exhilarating dream. And I'll read you for the last time. Suddenly, the immense but little known Amur River loomed into brilliant focus. Here would be Russia's archway to the Pacific, a titanic waterway flowing as if by providence from the belly of Siberia into an ocean of infinite promise. The trading concessions wrenched from China by the British and French, the prizing open of Japan, and above all, the arrival of a young and vigorous America on the opposite coast would surely transform the Pacific into an arena of world commerce. With Moravia of Caesar of the Amur from a helpless China in 1858, the vision of an Eastern destiny became euphoria. The Amur, it was declared, would become Russia's Mississippi. Soon, St. Petersburg was rife with reports of foreign merchant ships making for the Amur. The Lower River Valley was declared a free trade zone. And the fulcrum of these hopes was the newly founded port of Nikolaevsk at the Amur's mouth. Life was reported delightful. The Nikolaev stores were selling Havana cigars, French pate, and cognac. Susceptible minds twinned the town with San Francisco. Then, within a decade, harsh realities broke in. Far from being a riverine highway, the Amur was revealed as a labyrinth of shoals, shallows, dead ends, and for seven months of the year was sealed in ice or drift with dangerous flows. Ships sank even in the estuary. As for the Amur shores, for hundreds of miles, they were peopled only by a sprinkling of Cossacks, natives, and subsistence farmers. Many forcibly settled on poor lands and open to the floods that still ravage it. For its inhabitants, this became a cursed river not the little father of Russian's affection, though to dismayed naturalist, but her sickly child. As for Nikolaevsk, the last port bordering the Pacific, almost overnight it became a byword for boredom and immorality. In a gloomy hotel overlooking the main square, um, all I found was a guard um, on a closed circuit te television watching empty corridors. In my room, two little vodka glasses stood by the bed and my sheets were printed with red hearts and roses. I've been allotted the honeymoon suite. But in the morning, Nikolaevsk seemed to have belonged to a, 
poorer and to an earlier Russia to Soviet times. The quay side was half derelict, and the Amur flowed huge and indifferent past it out into the Pacific. So stark was this aura of earlier times that I began to feel I was being watched and followed as I used to be. In fact, the FSB, <clears throat> the descendants of the KGB, had started to follow me and wonder who and where I was and what I was doing. It was time to go home. Thank you very much. I'll take what questions I can. Blaine, you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? All right, I'm back. Can you hear me, Colin? I can. Okay. Um, I enjoyed this book immensely. Uh, I did not know about the existence of this river or its location, um, but I learned a great deal. The one thing that you didn't mention in your talk, although you did refer to it in passing, was the, 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 the trials, the physical trials of, of, of making this journey. Um, you fell off your horse early uh, in the trip, broke two ribs, fractured your ankle. And two or three times during the course of the, of the writing of this book, you mentioned that you would look in a mirror to discover a, a surprisingly tired looking elderly man who you didn't really recognize. And the reason I bring this up is because a few years ago before he died, I interviewed Richard Kapuscinski, the great Polish journalist and traveler. And he told me this, he said, with the coming of age, I feel travel as a kind of torture. It is a feeling of hopelessness, the waiting, waiting, waiting. When you are young, you don't feel the pressure, but when you're older, that pressure, pressure is terrible to sustain. And you write at one point in your new book, travel seems an exercise in failure. Please discuss, does your work get harder as years go by? Oh, what a question. Um, I think I didn't feel like Kapuscinski. Um, I basically, um, always feel that if you are passionate enough about a place that your, your mind will uh, drag your body along with it, um, which is what um, in the end happened to me. I have to say that I, I very early was in great pain, but what you do, um, you emerge from the Mongolian marshes um, and you go back to Ulaanbaatar, the X-ray you, they find it, everything's broken. You go back to London, you use, lose a year of your life. And uh, a year of my life is rather a lot at my age. And um, I simply persuaded myself that the ankle was only sprained and the ribs were only bruised and that it would all get better, which it did slowly. There's nothing much to do about broken ribs, in fact, except not, um, not cough or laugh. And there wasn't too much to laugh about anyway. And I, um, I, I just went on and things slowly healed themselves. Um, as for um, getting older, um, yes, I, I've never thought of myself as any particular age, um, which sounds ridiculous uh, in a man of my age, uh, but I don't make much allowances for it. Um, and uh, in general, I've been lucky in my health and felt fairly vigorous. So I was surprised when I did glimpse in the mirror or occasionally glimpsed in other people's attitudes to me that they were seeing this rather frail old man um, who was also limping. Hmm. There's, there's a very charming and self-deprecating section of the book when you're about to cross the, the Amur uh, from a Russian-speaking city uh, to a Chinese-speaking city, to a, a Mandarin-speaking city. Uh, and you prepare for this transition by practicing Mandarin in your Russian hotel, uh, I guess, before supper. And then at dinner, uh, as you write in the book, quote, I mistakenly ask for the lavatory in Mandarin, then order a meal in Russian and chat to a bewildered wait waitress in a deranged mixture of both. I have no idea what is going to come out of my mouth. But in fact, as I read the book, 
you use Russian and Mandarin to do a lot of your work. Uh, is it correct to say that your journey and your book would have been a failure without your gift and your discipline for languages? Well, that's generous. Um, yeah, I think the, the journey would have been impossible, really, uh, practically, um, without the languages. I don't speak either well, um, and Mandarin is almost forgotten, I have to say, and I had to try to retrieve it. Um, but the most important thing is that I wouldn't have been able to speak with people. Although a few of the people I met spoke some English, um, most did not. And uh, I simply wouldn't have been able to garner the sense of human contact that I was able to, to assess what people were feeling. Um, even people, um, say, in the Blagoveshensk market, speaking sort of about how much they dislike the Chinese, um, or indeed of Chinese uh, talking around me, um, or of Liang himself, my companion, um, who gave me um, various insights that I would have otherwise missed. So the language is essential. Yeah. Um, talking uh, uh, about geopolitics just a little bit, the river separates two vast and increasingly unequal uh, nations. Uh, the Chinese are getting richer while the Russians are not, particularly the Russians in the, in the Far East and in Siberia. You write in the book, uh, quote, China officially pushes conciliation with Russia while educating its youth in another possibility. That's the end of your quote. But what do you think will come of this growing disparity in wealth and power? Is it inevitable that an increasingly rich and swaggering China will push north into Siberia and the Russian Far East like they're doing in Taiwan and the South China Sea? It's a very hard and fraught question. And of course, I don't know the answer to it, um, even partially, let alone definitively. Um, <clears throat> I think there are mitigating factors. Uh, one is that for the moment, uh, China relies on Russian oil, gas, timber flowing southward out of Siberia. And there's a, and Russia, of course, desperately needs uh, the Chinese currency. So for the moment, there's a sort of harmony there, um, or at least an, an official accord. It's more along the Amu itself, I found, that there is real open um, hostility and anxiety about what is happening. Uh, there are various other things come into play. One is that this whole part of China, Manchuria, although it's quite heavily populated now, um, is not of area much favored by Chinese uh, for the future. That, of course, is all in Shenzhen in the south, um, where the powerhouse of, of Chinese industry uh, and commerce is. And although this area was um, <clears throat> of Manchuria, uh, close to the Amur River, if you like, which we saw, was an industrial, um, uh, an industrial initiative by Mao Zedong in the 1950s, um, wanting to turn it into a big industrial area <coughs> supported by large collective and state farms. Um, all that has rather faded away. And so there's not a, a real pressure of Chinese at the moment, um, certainly in terms of population, to cross the Amur in the way that the Russians fear. So there's a sort of standoff there. And I would say that um, there's nothing, um, nothing imminent about, uh, about conflict in that area. It's only that the Chinese have not forgotten that it was taken from them. And that museum that I was visiting, for instance, was what they call a patriotic education center, in this case, built in 2002, which seems to be educating the Chinese in a history that is a good deal more complex and potentially unhappy uh, than what Beijing and Moscow are officially concluding together. Hmm. Hmm. On the ground, from your interviews, and, and, and that really is the source of your book, is your conversations with, with, with regular people that you encounter. I get the feeling from your book that the striving Chinese working classes who live near this river 
really don't give a hoot about the Russians who live on the other side. Um, they're much more interested in themselves and their own emerging prosperity. Uh, they see the Russians, it, it, there's almost a caricature of the Russians as poor, unskilled, alcoholic, rather hairy, and mostly irrelevant to their future. On the, other, on the north side of the river, however, the Russians do care about the Chinese, not because they like them, but because they envy and resent them. Do I have this right as you perceived it from your travels? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's a very good paraphrase of exactly how the two, feeding, two sides, sides, if you like, countries uh, feel about one another. Um, exactly. There's, there's another uh, uh, sort of generalization that you give about Russia that I think is really interesting to an American audience. You write in the book that Russian culture and politics are still strongly influenced by two centuries of subjugation that began in the 13th century under Genghis Khan and the Golden Hordes. You say that, uh, quote, Ivan the Terrible, Stalin and Putin, and Putin became the offspring of Genghis Khan, forever separating Russia from Western Europe. Um, did your travels on this river reinforce that insight into the Russian character? Well, of course, when I said that, I made it a little bit fanciful um, mm -hmm. that this could conceivably be so. Um, there is an idea, um, and I think always has been um, since the 17th century at any rate, that Russia um, was held back um, from European enlightenment um, by the Mongol oppression. It's, um, it's quite a controversial idea in Mongolian studies now, in, in the studies of the, of the Mongol empires. But um, hard to say that, um, you know, I hate to generalize too much about the Russian character. Of course, it's dangerous as we do about um, any culture or character. But um, it's, I think, more apparent in government um, than it is in ordinary people that as the Russians themselves sometimes say, um, you know, we, um, we, need, we need autocracy, um, we need governance. Um, this is dangerous territory to talk about, um, but the Russians themselves will say it sometimes mm. about, about themselves, that their, their autocracy is in some way traditional and natural to them. It's possible to um, lay that um, at the, at the, the feet of the, the Mongol, Mongols all these years ago, but it would be a dangerous speculation. Right. And I only, I think, play with it as, as a possibility or as a, as a, a, a little one. Um, mm, I'd, like I'd like to ask a few questions about travel writing. Um, you are perhaps one of the greatest experts uh, on earth on this subject because of your because you've, you've been involved in organizations of travel writing and because of your, your terrific uh, books. Um, the, 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 one qu the first question that, that comes to mind is, you know, in our era of climate change, should people follow your example and travel by carbon spewing airplanes to far corners of the earth? You, know, you were asked about this recently when you had lunch with somebody from the Financial Times. And your answer was, you know, that honestly, that's a good question. And my only defense is that I think that mainly my books put people off traveling. Now, what did you mean by that? <laughs> well, they're not like guidebooks. They're not encouraging or educating people um, to take their own journeys. They are accounts of journeys that um, nobody in their right mind is going to take. <laughs> um, people are not going to go on this river, um, nor is my writing inviting them to do so. Um, it acknowledges that it's very tough, it's often very poor, and in general my travel books have been like that. I, I think they've not been those that um, encourage tourism, um, very much the sort of books that people read, I think, instead of going, um, you do their journeying for them and <clears throat> sometimes have a bad time for them. And I, I think quite seriously that that is uh, one of the effects of my book. The other is, I suppose, that um, you travel, uh, I mean, in this case along the Amur, you know, you may travel many months and your 
only real carbon emission is the, the air flight that took you there. So it's not as if you're um, jetting back and forth anywhere. Uh, you disappear into a country after initially reaching it uh, by plane, which is not to exonerate myself. Um, I have a bad carbon footprint. Well, paradoxically, you seem to be saving carbon emissions by uh, writing these books and, keep, and scaring people off from traveling. <laughs> um, I, I had one more question about the, 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 the art and practice of travel writing. I have concluded from your previous interviews and from this book that your advice to would-be travel writers can be boiled down to three rather hard-nosed maxims. One, always travel alone. Two, learn to speak the language of the place you are traveling. And three, bring just one pair of pants. <laughs> Would you please elaborate on these three principles? <laughs> well, um, the pair of pants is uh, just an invocation for traveling as light as possible. Um, I lay everything out that I think I'm going to need and ask myself, do I really need that? And the answer is almost always no. It's astonishing how light you can travel. Um, on the first one, the important one about traveling alone, um, I'm talking about a certain kind of traveling now. Um, it's not tourism, it's not even traveling specifically for enjoyment. It's traveling for some kind of understanding. And um, I think if you travel with somebody else of your own culture, you are, as it were, allowing yourself to sit in a, a bubble a bubble of comfort, if you like, in which you look out and validate your own culture between you while looking out on your surroundings and finding them perhaps odd or uh, <clears throat> whatever, but um, never with that sense of vulnerability that you have if you're alone. If you're alone, um, you're the odd one in the landscape. Um, you're aware that you have to understand um, the, the forces to understand um, where you are quicker than you would if you were preserving the, uh, the remnants of your own world with you. Instead, there's a sort of vulnerability and, and a solitude to this sort of traveling, but it is more, um, it, I think it teaches you better um, about where you are. In addition to the fact that if you're traveling alone, a lot of people think you're lonely, and so they're apt to come and talk to you. And that, that too is a, is a huge benefit when, above all, you're wanting to communicate with people. Mm -hmm. And your middle, um, I forget what your middle- The middle question was about language, and I think language. you've already answered that one, yeah. It, it, this sounds very, very demanding, um, and is the sort of thing that, you know, people who I suppose I could call themselves professional, like myself, um, have to do or, or might have to do and to ask people um, who are simply going for a shorter time uh, to learn the language in any, um, any deep way um, is, is, I think, much too harsh. But for me and for the likes of um, other travel writers, I think if you're trying to write the sort of books that I am, then you have to make an attempt at languages, which is, I know, very difficult. I've suffered this myself and I can't pretend that I speak either Russian or Mandarin at all well, but um, I've tried. Yeah, and it does seem key. There's one, one last question I wanna ask about the book. And uh, it, it struck me throughout the book. It's, there is an autumnal, almost despairing tone to the final chapters of the book. You write that the Amur River once held great promise as an economic artery and pathway to global power something akin to the Mississippi in America. But what you found was an often frozen, often unnavigable river that has become a lonely highway to nowhere. Uh, interesting mostly because of the Stalinist slaughters and cultural genocide that occurred along its shores nearly a century ago. Near the mouth of the river and the conclusion of the book, you write, the solitude of its end reminds me of no river I've ever seen. Is this the saddest of your travel books? Um, I don't know. It may be. Um, uh, partly because of the, the river, this great river, the only one large river in Russia that flows west-east 
um, has flowed into uh, an area that holds no promise. Um, if you like, the center of gravity for, the, uh, for Russia and the Pacific has moved to Vladivostok, far to the south, which is a harbor free of ice flows and so on. So, um, yes, there is an autumnal feeling um, because of that um, and because of the sadness of many of the people along the river. Um, it's sort of hardness, you know, there's always that Russian ability to endure, um, often with humor. Um, but there's also a depletion um, very much often in population in both the small villages and, and the larger towns. So yes, there's a, a, a kind of sadness that does pervade the book, I'm sure. Um, and it's, it's because of that. Mm -hmm. um, what's next for you, a novel? Well, between the travel books, I've always wanted to write a novel. So I suppose if I'm lucky at my age, um, I shall finish a novel. Novels start with some very different area of myself. Um, you know, after maybe four years of concentrating on somewhere far away, um, obviously one's personal and psyche, one's personal life and so on, um, has gone on on a parallel track, um, which you certainly haven't um, pillaged for any so-called creative purposes. So it's a way of looking at myself afterwards, and not myself necessarily, but at a, looking at the world in another way than, mm -hmm. uh, than travel does. And usually some little germ um, emerges, some, something that um, you feel needs uh, expansion or development or explaining or something. And that, that's where a novel begins. So um, it will be a novel next. I'm very flattered that you say, um, what will be next? Because most people now say, surely this is your last book, isn't it? Um, so I'm, I'm pleased that you are suggesting a future. Well, can you conceive of your life without the process uh, of working on another book? It's very hard. Um, I've always, um, even when I was in the mid 60s, writing my first travel books and attempting um, novels which reached the dustbin. <coughs> um, e even then, I always had a book in train. I couldn't imagine not writing a book. And each book, often in the case of the travel books, was a reaction against the previous one with which I was unhappy. Um, and each of the later travel books were sort of an obsession probably that developed as a result of the previous travel. So there's always been an impetus um, to, to continue. And I, it is hard for me to imagine a life without writing. It becomes your, your habit and your, even if you don't have to do it financially, as I used to do, um, it, it becomes a, a sort of psychic necessity. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, 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 I'm, I, I, the book was marvelously well written. So, um, you know, I does, it doesn't seem to me that you're, you're losing a step, um, at least in, in the literary uh, aspect of the writing. I, I, I read it, 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 the FT story suggested that you might be sniffing after a story uh, with the uh, declining ice, declining glaciers in Chile. Uh, it wouldn't be for a travel book or even for a novel. Um, um, I... I I, I know nothing of the cultures um, of South America. Um, I don't speak Spanish. Um, uh, that, would, that would be for pleasure. Oh, Just um, traveling, I hope, with my wife um, a, a little bit toughly, but, uh, but basically for pleasure. There, there are some questions that I see here from, from, from people. And let me ask a couple of them I can see here on the, on the chat line. Uh, uh, a recent uh, piece in the Times Literary Supplement suggested that travel and writing such as you have done all your life is a version of British imperialism. Um, and this is a question I'm sure you've, you've, you've battled with before. Uh, could you do that, do so again? <laughs> well, of course it's, it is in its way an absolutely valid critique and I'm a, a natural target for it. Here I am. A, public school educated uh, white male uh, traveling in areas of the world which are much poorer than my own by and large. 
And of course, you have power in a way, in as much as by traveling in somewhere like uh, Siberia or China, you are seeing these countries in a way that they usually cannot see yours. And you're meeting people who don't have the privilege that you do of being able to travel away. So you have the advantage, if you like, of knowing something about their world and they um, almost nothing of yours, um, except what is pervade often um, very skewed uh, through the media. So there, there's an imbalance of power, but what do you do about it? Um, to imagine always that these confrontations or these, um, these relationships of one fallen person with another are uh, predominantly uh, those of power is I think a, a rather paranoid way of looking at it. Um, if we always think in those terms, then no human communication is possible. Um, every relationship we have, if we examine them, even towards one another in our own countries, has an element of power imbalance. And this is vastly exaggerated, of course, when you are abroad. But travel writers can be going for many things. It certainly shouldn't be, or uh, is, is not, I hope in my case, any, um, any desire to impose anything on others. It may be the exercise of a tradition um, that can be very ugly, but it's possible to travel for understanding, um, for desire, for mutual friendship even, which is always one of the happiest things um, of travel when across the borders of, of politics and uh, culture and race, um, you find common ground, common human ground with somebody. These things are all, to me, the major, the, the major benefits um, of travel. In uh, if we are to talk about this fraught area of of power and neo-colonialism, mm -hmm. I can see where where that's coming from, and it may be that my sort of traveling in which somebody has an adventure and records it in a, in a tough part of the world um, will be in decline. It possibly already is. Um, travel writing can go in all sorts of directions. It's a very flexible medium and it needn't be uh, what I am doing. But in the, the practical way you put together your books, from what I've read, is that the travel itself it amounts to perhaps even less than a third or a quarter of the time that you've spent in the from conception to execution of one of these books. The bulk of the time is spent in libraries uh, researching the, the, all the facts surrounding sort of the superstructure of what you encountered in your journey. And then the writing, the polishing of the words. Um, is, is that an accurate uh, portrayal of, of, of how you pull these books together? Yes, absolutely. Um, usually the research for a book um, take me at least a year and a half. Um, and in the case of this one, um, attempt to uh, retrieve half forgotten languages. Um, then the journey itself may be typically five months perhaps. And after that, the writing of it will take, oh, the initial creative writing so-called would take over a year and then it's polished and you're dealing with proofs and so on. So it's rather um, humiliating, but the actual uh, the period of travel is small compared, it's the vital part, but it's small compared to the preparation and the writing of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's another question here about, were you at all tempted to continue on to Sakhalin Island uh, since you were already there at the mouth of the, of the Amur and, and you were so close? Did that hold any interest or was that outside of the, the conception of the book? It was outside the conception of the river for me. By that time, the river has lost itself in the Sea of Orcos and the Pacific. Sakhalin Island is fascinating, I think. I've never been. Uh, Chekhov, of course, went in 1890, mm -hmm. um, at which time it was a convict island. Um, and I'm sure it's full of interest, but I felt that the natural, the, the natural end 
was where the river ends. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's one other question that, that because we are, uh, uh, I, we live, I live in, in, in liberal Seattle and we're uh, sort of in post Trump uh, uh, stress syndrome or whatever you call it. Um, but as you traveled this river, and you know it had been uh, well 80, 90 years since Stalin's death, and I don't want to compare Trump to Stalin, but the the there was a certain hunger in the Russian side for the simplicities of 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 Stalin's solutions to the to life's nagging problems that 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 persisted, and you heard many Russians speak rather. Uh, wistfully and affectionately at, at the simple solutions to a complicated world. It, it, the power of, of, a, of a demagogue to last in people's imagination years after they're out of power and dead. Um, does, does, does that question resonate in your mind from what you heard in your travels? Yes, um, particularly an older generation um, will speak of Stalin as if he is a kind of national savior. Um, they think of him in terms not of the gulags so much, um, and not of all the, the sort of paranoid end of his life, but in what they conceive he achieved during the Second World War, what they call the Great Patriotic War. Uh, the Russians typically, and to some extent justly, feel that this was their war, um, and the, the West had a, a a, a much lesser part in it. And of course, it was Russia that suffered uh, most extremely, and Russia that, um, in, in spite of the iniquitous treaty that Russia and Germany originally made in partitioning Poland, um, and that Stalin thought um, was going to uh, ex make the country immune from invasion from Hitler, um, in spite of all that, they feel Stalin won the war for them. They talk about jumping into tanks, you know, their fathers um, saying long live Stalin and so on. And they associate him with that. In fact, um, there's certainly an argument that Stalin, uh, well, he certainly panicked um, when Hitler suddenly invaded Russia. And there are all sorts of correctives to this view um, that uh, he was a great hero. But um, it's, uh, it's he that um, was their great Bosch, their leader, throughout that period where the, the country really felt it was um, in, in peril, it, and, and it was. And so he does occupy a rather curious position um, in the Russian psyche because they sort of know that he was uh, about his harshness, but they would like to minimize it. And I'm talking about in particular, rather older Chinese, not young uh, Russians, not, not young Russians, um, much more uh, an older generation. There is a sort of feeling that those were times when um, all the complexities of modern life and of, um, of a so-called uh, free market and so on, uh, they were all smoothed out. Everything was settled for you. Mm -hmm. You had an assured pension. You had an assured job. Um, all these things were were things you didn't have to worry about, even if they were desperately poor. And so it's perfectly possible, particularly for poorer Russians, to look back and find that a, a time of relative uh, calm and content. On the contrary, there, uh, does Putin hold a similarly uh, important role in their conception of, uh, of, of, of great leadership? Um, he holds the image, which is especially cultivated, of being a, a, powerful, uh, a, a powerful leader of the country. Um, this image has become rather tarnished. I mean, as conditions get no better, um, so they get disillusioned. And he can never have the aura that Stalin does. Um, so uh, there's an ambiguity um, when they come to think of Putin. Um, I've had a lot of disillusion in him of a kind that I don't think you'd have heard of Stalin. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, well, I don't see any other questions from, uh, the, from, from watchers. Um, Wayne, uh, we have more questions in the Q&A. 
and can, we can pick a few from there. I think maybe, it's people, can you, let's see if I, I, I'm not sure I can see it, have access. Okay, I'll, I'll take it from okay. here. All right. So we have two people asking about the indigenous people living along the river. Uh, what's the state of their living and did you have uh, much chance to interact with them? Thank you for that question. Um, because these indigenous peoples who are very few and small compared to the main Russian population are often overlooked. My own experience with, with the Nanai people, um, very, very small again, a few hundred thousand um, in the very far east, and the Uchi, um, who are an even smaller people whose tradition is, um, is interestingly uh, uh, one of veneration for bears. I did have um, some communication with these people, some on the Chinese side, um, others on the Russian. On the Russian side in particular, uh, they, are, they seem to be uh, fishing peoples along where I was traveling and that, that's traditional. But along with the Russians, um, their lives are very hard. Um, the fishing um, for various reasons is depleting, uh, perhaps still. Uh, mainly because of fishing fleets um, who are exceeding their quotas in the, in the mouth of the Amur River. Uh, so their lives are hard. And in some cases, um, among the Ulchi, I found villages that are virtually disappearing. And uh, in one, somebody saying he's almost the last inhabitant. So it's not, a, it's not an easy picture for these peoples. And um, I think in particular, there's this ugly uh, Soviet residue that their children were taken from them very often if they were reindeer herders or whoever they were um, and were forcibly educated in what they call the internet, uh, the uh, schools which were supposed to turn them into good Soviet citizens. But of course they were being taught things and understanding things that had nothing to do with their homelands back in the country, back in, among the reindeer herders with the fishing people. And so there was a great, um, a, a great estrangement between children and parent, very often between child and parent. Um, that is not as, I think, as widespread as it was, but always there's this um, feeling amongst them that they lost their culture to the Soviet culture and then lost their Soviet culture uh, to the post-Soviet world that followed with Gorbachev and Yeltsin. So their position, and it's probably harder for them to get work than it is for the Russians, than the native Russians, um, it, it, it's not happy. I found the questions now, uh, the, the Q&A, and there, there's one about wildlife and birds. And towards the end of your uh, journey on the river, it became much more interesting from uh, the, the, the abundance of, of fish and different wildlife. And you, in particular, talk about bears. And I want you to uh, question, uh, uh, address the question of bears. You, you write in the book that, that uh, there's, there's myths among some of these indigenous people that, that bears take uh, local women as wives and, and actually sire children. And that when uh, a bear kills a, a, a member of some indigenous tribe, that, that in, individual male who's been killed by a bear, he returns as a bear or uh, just uh, talk about uh, bears and wildlife uh, along the river. Well, um, I wish I'd seen a bear. I never <laughs> did. I was always being warned about bears um, and had hoped to come across one, but, but never did. Um, the, uh, the, the bear worship, which it almost was, um, was conducted above all, I think, by the Uchi. And they, for instance, I mean, this is... Um, an indication of how their culture has stagnated, really. Um, they used to have a ceremony. Um, and in the 1990s, I think, uh, there was a little cel ceremonial uh, village um, where bears were routinely kept and pampered by the women in enormous cages, and then were, well, not so enormous, rather cramped cages, and then were taken out and ritually shot to death. And it wasn't, um, it was meant to be a sort of pious act in a way, and that the 
spirit of the bear um, would return to its ancestors and the tribe, they would eat the bear, um, the, the, the indigenous peoples, um, their men at any rate would feast on the bear and be granted its strength. But it typically, um, that was 20 years ago that that um, ceremony was allowed and has since been closed down. So those sort of initiatives have, um, have I think, um, met a, a dead end. Um, in general, I found some uh, native peoples who were anxious to recover um, their culture, but it seems to be being recovered in a rather um, restricted way um, and as if it's a little irrelevant to ordinary life. As for other wildlife, um, it's, it was there all right. I didn't encounter it very much myself. There are these beautiful cranes in the upper Amur, the Onon, um, various types of crane, migrating birds, which are, are lovely. Um, but uh, of course, it's the fish you're most conscious of um, on the lower Amur. And these are interesting because they, um, they combine the, uh, the Arctic um, species of, of, of uh, North Russia, um, the taimen and the salmon and so on, with the uh, southerly mortar species of China. So you get a, a unique mix um, in which you get a, a creature called the snakehead, uh, a, a, a southerly creature which can survive um, without oxygen in the open air for several days, um, uh, together with the uh, kaluga, say the great, great um, kaluga sturgeon of the, the Russian waters. And these, these creatures, um, to some extent at least, intermingle and can all be found in a single river. The great fish is the salmon, the dog salmon, which starts its life high up the Amur in, in little creeks. And then uh, as caviar, basically, then it, it flows down the river to the Pacific and it remains in the Pacific for four years, probably even more. Um, and where it develops into a, a quite a large salmonid fish. And then by some mysterious instinct um, that those fish will find their way back up river to the place where they were born. It seems almost by some sense of smell even, and nobody is absolutely sure. And there, um, the uh, adult fish, uh, the row, the row gets fertilized by the, by the male uh, fish who sprays it by the male salmon, and the adult fish float to the surface, um, dead, where they get scavenged by bears, and the whole cycle starts again. Yeah, the, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, we have one great river, the Columbia, which was the premier salmon highway on earth until uh, the 1940s when we put in these giant hunks of concrete and systematically decimated the salmon. Uh, and the, uh, it's, 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 it's a story that hasn't happened on the Amur, as you say, because the, it, there's different governments on the different banks of the river and nobody can agree to build a dam. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, there's suspicion. Um, and it's not, I venture to think, out of any consideration for the salmon um, <laughs> or, or any other fish. Right. It's because the countries, Russia in particular, um, is suspicious of such moves by the Chinese. There's scarcely a bridge across the river, let alone a dam. Um, when I was there, there was um, the first real bridge being completed uh, near Blagoveshensk. And so um, uh, it, it, there's still a long way from that kind of agreement. There's a question about pollution uh, of the river. It, from, from the reading of the book, it sounds as if most of the pollution in this river comes from industrial China. And that is, uh, and the, that is wh wh where, where the sources of that pollution are, is where the river is most dirty and, and dangerous to drink the water with, with heavy metals and stuff. But that it should go farther away from, from China up towards the mouth of the, of the river, uh, it becomes considerably um, more clean. Is that true? Yes, I think so. In general, it's not to say that there isn't some uh, sometimes illicit gold mining uh, quite high up the river, 
and certainly where the Zea River comes down from Russia, um, there's pollution. But on the whole, um, it's a byproduct of the wealth of China and the poverty of Russia uh, that this is so. Um, up the Songhua River um, from China, there are these very large industrial cities um, which have sometimes sent uh, disastrous slews uh, of, of toxins um, into the into the Amur. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, I, I think um, I've not seen any actual uh, recent measurements of, of figures, but it's uh, it, the, the Russians certainly claim that the main pollutants are China. There's another question about whether the people you encountered on either side of the river ask much about Britain or particularly about the United States. Um, and I noticed that in your book, you mentioned that a number of these people, including very remote indigenous people, had children who lived far away. I, I remember a couple who, who, who mentioned they had a daughter in Scotland. Um, but it, are they are they interested in the United States and do they talk about it? Uh, well, there is a little such immigration and it always startles them to find it. It's a lot rather unusual, but it will come from time to time. Um, as for, uh, it, it's hard, you know, um, on the whole, they're so busy getting on with their own lives that their ideas of the West come perhaps through television um, sometimes they're exaggeratedly um, favorable in a way. You know, there are uh, Mexican soap operas, as it were, that um, make, the, uh, make, make people believe that the West is a, is a realm of swimming pools and, and fast cars. Mm -hmm. um, and on the whole, I suppose this is a terrible generalization. I would say there's just a, a, a feeling among young people that the West is where it's at. Um, the West is the cool place. Um, and in, incipiently, there are people who would like to go and live in the West, uh, like to go, or at least, if you like, the, the villagers want to go into the towns, the Russian towns, the Russian people in the Russian towns want to go to the Russian cities, people in the Russian cities want to go to Moscow. And some people in Moscow want to go to the United States. Yeah. There, it, it's a, there's a sort of cultural thing. It's interesting that there's very little um, admiration or yearning for the Chinese culture in Russia, in Russia or for the Russian culture in China. Um, it is somehow the West that is still holding that, uh, that lure of something that's cool and young and, and with it. Mm. Um, I, I don't see any more questions. Uh, uh, and uh, have, we, have we come to the, the, the end? Maybe we can have a final question about what comes next. Will there be a memoir or another expedition? Uh, another? Expedition. Oh, expedition. Um, I'm always so flattered by that question. <laughs> Nowadays, I used to be bored by it. Um, it's lovely to think of, a, of another expedition at my age, but I think it'll be a novel. Um, I'm guessing because the novel has only just begun to wriggle a little in my head. But um, of an expedition, I'm always almost reluctant to, to discover or, or think of a place that I'm longing to go to, because then it nags at me. I'm a bit obsessive and I become a great bore about it and can't think of much else. So I'm almost purposely trying not to find an object for a new expedition uh, while I can write a novel in peace. Mm. Would a memoir, would that be on the horizon? Um, I don't think so. No, I, I suppose if it seems like autobiography, then um, I'm not particularly keen. I, I feel the, more, the sort of more important parts of my life are there in the travel books. And so I doubt if there'll be a memoir. Thank you so much, both Kala and Blaine, for such a wonderful conversation today. Kevin, can we have the last slide, please? So please join us next month on November 13th for a lecture titled 
literary plunder, the making and the unmaking of Pibu Sultan's library. So that will be really interesting. Another journey um, through the um, building of the library. So hope to see you all then. Thank you again, Colin and Blaine. Thank you. Thank you.